be here in just a minute. So welcome everyone to this Vinny Forum Twitter space. Really excited for today's topic, Bitcoin OPSEC security and privacy with uh, some of our speakers. We've got Ergo here, who's been a speaker at the Guns and Bitcoin conferences and really glad that he's going to be here speaking on these three topics. And then Diverter is going to join here in a minute. And he also has been a previous speaker at the Guns and Bitcoin conference conferences and will also be a speaker again at Finney Forum. So um, for those of you who don't know Ergo, he works with OXT.me, uh, which is part of Samurai. So uh, Ergo, uh, go ahead and speak up and uh, tell everyone a little bit about what you do. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I can hear you now. Um, yeah, so I see Divertis just hopped in too. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I started with OXT, I guess, 2020. Uh, for those of you that don't know, OXT is sort of the internal um, analytics platform uh, supported by Samurai Wallet, uh, our sort of like primary purposes I guess, helping Samurai build uh, tools and countermeasures and privacy uh, preserving techniques to be integrated into the wallet and tested properly. Um, and as sort of secondary to that, we uh, will investigate what are sort of interesting, you know, topics around blockchain forensics and uh, keep up with the state of the art of sort of the uh, broader blockchain surveillance network. Perfect. Thank you. And Diverter. Diverter's done a lot as well. He's written a lot of guides about privacy, Bitcoin mining. So Diverter, go ahead and unmute your microphone and just uh, introduce yourself for a second. Hey, uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, just like I said, I just some dude that kind of likes Bitcoin. Um, and then pretty pretty uh, early on, fell down the, uh, the privacy rabbit hole and ended up in the Samurai Wallet community mostly, um, you know, just did a couple of things, try to write some guys that have some uh, things be available to people that maybe wouldn't have been before, or uh, in the case of mining, maybe try to change a little bit of perspective there. Um, but yeah, I just kind of hang around and aggravate people on Twitter and still do some of that same stuff. <laughs> Uh, Diverto, you didn't bring in, bring up being an award winner, but we'll just chalk that up to you being a whole well, guy. I, I figured um, that would come up later as we talked about the conference. <clears throat> you know, it's got to come up eventually. Oh, yeah, yeah, for for sure, it's going to be the highlight of the Twitter space today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and then BTZ Zalco is joining us. He's probably not going to be able to speak uh, for for one issue, but he's here listening and. If something changes, he might be able to jump in, but otherwise he's here with uh, support. And Zelko will also be a speaker at Finney Forum 2024. So for those who don't know, Finney Forum 2024 is May 15th and 16th in Dallas, Texas. Right now, early bird tickets are only $99. All these guys are speakers at the conference. We're going to talk about Bitcoin, Monero, mm -hmm. privacy, and cybersecurity at Finney Forum. So make sure you check out FinneyForum.com and, of course, our Twitter space uh, who's hosting this. So let's jump right into it. Um, we're going to cover three topics, OPSEC, security, and privacy. But I think I want to start off with how are these attacked? Um, Erga, you talked about uh, OXT and analytics, and you're kind of right there at the front line. So how is it, you could pick any of this, either your OPSEC is attacked, your security is attacked, or your privacy is attacked. What are the tools and tactics that people use or governments use for that, those three things. It, yeah, I guess I'll take a tack that focuses on, you know, the on-chain analytics side. Um, I'm not sure you can separate all three, privacy, OPSEC, security. Um, more broadly, I can describe how those are attacked. Um, there's usually sort of like a, a three-step process there. 
one is sort of the in, initial attribution that is done by an analyst, right? An analyst usually needs some sort of starting point to begin an analysis work um, in order to track some sort of, uh, we'll just call it target. Um, from there, they'll observe sort of the, the on-chain blockchain flows. And hopefully at the end of their, their trail, they'll intersect with some sort of KYC exchange. And from there, they can uh, do whatever that they sort of need to do in terms of identifying the entity uh, further. Um, so those are the, sort of the three-step process. Um, and if you want to sort of protect yourself from any of those, uh, from that sort of uh, attack, uh, you just need to interrupt any one of those three uh, processes in any way, right? So to avoid the initial attribution, uh, you can avoid posting sort of static uh, receipt addresses uh, that give investigators a, an initial starting point. You can also uh, obscure and protect the flows of your future spending by coin joining or using tools like Monero. And uh, the last step is usually to avoid sort of uh, interacting with KYC entities who are going to uh, provide your information uh, related to your transactions to any sort of investigator. So those are sort of the big three. Very well summarized. I, I like that a lot. So we can take take all three of those and kind of start off with attribution. So I've read, um, I started a uh, blockchain intelligence blog uh, last month, and I posted a lot on this topic of, of darknet markets and criminals, like true criminals, not fake criminals, but true criminals, um, and how the governments find them and track them down. And I've always been surprised at um, the combination of mistakes that they made. And often, it's not just on-chain analytics. That's often not enough, especially if you, you want to make a real court case. Often it's other things. And so, Erga, you mentioned those three things, and that's often the case. And the first one um, is attribution, and that's often where people can go wrong. Um, so this is a question for both Ergo and Diverter. How can your an address, you create a fresh wallet, a fresh address, how could that possibly be linked to you as a person in any way uh yeah i'll just take off here on that so um as you mentioned you, you know you can create a a fresh wallet you know if so we're talking about bitcoin here um you know bitcoin does not offer anonymity it offers pseudonymity um so you know as in you're gonna have maybe a public uh address that anybody can see um but at that point there is no uh, real world attachment to any identity so the key is you know kind of keep it that way so one of the problems that are uh, that uh, we have is people um, may be seeking out a donation so they'll post um, at this address on their twitter profile or uh, on a blog site or wherever so once you have posted that address um, that specifically is going to associate that with your identity so obviously we want to avoid doing that um if you but th there are there are also a lot more sneaky ways that that could be tied to you so one example of that would be say you create um a, a brand new wallet completely a distinct address now but let's say you um withdraw um bitcoin from an exchange that you have done KYC on. So you have handed over all of your identity on this exchange. Um, now you create this new wallet and then you think, okay, I, I've just created a new wallet. There's no way that they can track or know for, for sure that this is me. So what's gonna happen? I'll, I'll withdraw this Bitcoin from this KYC exchange to this different address. Or even say it's a it's the, your second hop. You withdraw it to the same wallet that you had before, but then you just spend it all directly to that new address. Well, the problem with that is uh, comes in with blockchain analytics, and I know Ergo can, can speak to this. Uh, but there are several heuristics that will be used to um, make, I guess, what you would call an educated guess, except. The problem is they don't call it an educated guess. They call it a fact. Um, and they'll tell you that uh, there's a 100% chance that that Bitcoin still belongs to you. And um, 
it's very easy to to make a mistake um, when you do when you're using Bitcoin if you don't use proper wallets, one that doesn't have, give you coin control, one that gives you no way to introduce forward privacy, um, which is the vast majority of Bitcoin wallets. So there are several different ways that that an address that in in theory has no tie to any identity can very easily be linked to a previously established identity on the chain or even off chain. So it's it's a very tricky subject. I like I like that you summarized that well. You used a five dollar word heuristics. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so maybe Ergo can jump in here with heuristics. And what is that? And maybe kind of detail, like what kind of heuristic? What's what's the are talking about? Yeah. So the the five dollar definition for the five dollar word is uh, decision making under uncertain outcomes. But really, it's just uh, shorthand for that is just educated guess. Um, and there's a few heuristics that are used uh, in blockchain tracing. Most of them have to do with detecting change outputs, which are sort of a consequence of how Bitcoin works. Uh, and there are some ways that those can be sort of circumvented by wallet software, but generally change outputs for spending are sort of unavoidable. So those are the main method by which uh, future spending can be sort of tracked and uh, an analyst can, can follow the same person across multiple transactions. Yeah, so let's get a good example of that. So let's say that you create a new wallet with a new address and you fund it with, let's say a hundred dollars and, uh, and you buy some things for, you know, $75. Now you have $25 left. You bought two things and then you have change address. And then if you want to buy something else for $50, well, you don't have, you only have $25. So now you get to get the rest of that money from maybe a different wallet that you own. So then you have a couple of problems there, right? Yeah, um, this introduces sort of the next main heuristic, uh, the common input ownership heuristic, uh, more simply referred to usually as the co-spend heuristic, which is just the assumption that the same private key or the same wallet software or implicitly the same user controls all of the inputs to the same transaction. So, you know, in sort of your example, if you've got, uh, you need to spend $50, but you have two $25 bits of Bitcoin. You need to combine those two in the same transaction in order to make that $50 spend. Uh, and that'll be, uh, leads to some additional sort of trail and tracing that uh, analysts can then kind of apply to both of those inputs. Great. Now, Deverter brought up a good point immediately. He said, this is Bitcoin. So let's contrast these issues with Monero and how it's different. So we're, we're on the first topic of attribution. And attribution is an address. I think Deverter, one of the first things he says is a public address. You might put on your Twitter profile. Maybe someone just knows it by looking at the transaction between the two of you, or just there's lots of ways you could kind of find an address. So let's contrast this with Monero. So number one is attribution in terms of an address. The other one is change outputs. So I'll let either of you guys uh, address those, how Monero is different with a public address that can be known and also kind of change and, and combining UTXOs. How, how does Monero compare to that? Uh, yeah, well, Monero uses uh, completely... Uh, a completely, I completely, I want you to call, I guess, holistic approach um, to this sort of privacy. Whereas with Bitcoin, you kind of have to introduce all these things yourself um, and you still can't get rid of the address. So um, uh, Monero uses uh, stealth addresses. Um, you have uh, sub addresses that, you know, you come from your main wallet address, which you, you if you use Monero, you realize that kind of your main wallet address will, will start with a four and then your sub addresses you know additional addresses that you can get from there will, will start with an eight um so those are completely um distinct from each other in a way that addresses on bitcoin are not and monero transactions use uh, ring signatures so on bitcoin when you um, send a transaction like Ergo was talking about you have the common input ownership heuristic where it's assumed that um, the in, 
uh, inputs on the input side are all controlled by the same entity. You can't, that is, there is no assumption like that on Monero, but there have a, there's a ring signature with, which if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's either 11 or 15, I can't remember which one it is now, um, but there are just say 11 different uh, input transactions or input that look like they could each one could contribute to this transaction so there's no way to pinpoint and say this is the author of this transaction because Monero will pull several inputs from all over the the blockchain um, bigger one I mean you there is no blockchain explorer that you will be able to um, anyone with the internet can just hook up to and look at all of the Monero transactions they don't exist that way um, you want to look at the Monero transactions, you need the view keys, the spin keys from the actual transactions themselves. So you still can, if you're a Monero user, you still can prove that um, some Monero was sent. Uh, you still can prove all these things, uh, but it's just done in a much more privacy-preserving way than it is on Bitcoin. Whereas on Bitcoin, when you want to you want to prove that you sent a transaction, what you do, you go to probably like... Um, Probably like mempool.space or, or zero XT is, is the, a really good one. Um, and you pop in the transaction ID to that and you send the link. You say, Here's your proof, right? It's public. Everybody can see it. Whereas with Monero, when you want to prove you had to send a transaction, you have to actually take your view keys. Your, people that are involved in the transaction can see this because you allow them to see it. So it's, it's essentially the definition of privacy. Privacy being the ability to selectively reveal what you want to the world. Um, that's, that's essentially what, what the definition of that is. So um, Monero is, is much, much different as far as an attribution because you can post an address with Monero. They're not going to be able to definitively follow what you then do with that Monero behind it. So it's much, much different um, than Bitcoin. It, it, it can be handled I guess what you would call much more loosely um, than Bitcoin can. If you want to guard your privacy on Bitcoin, you, you kind of have to be, be on your game. You have to be tight. With Monero, it loosens things up quite a bit, which is a, precisely why it has taken so much of the market share on darknet markets because they don't really have to educate users nearly as much um, about the dangers of usage. You can just kind of use it. Um, whereas Bitcoin, there's an entire knowledge base that needs to be understood to be able to use it properly and privately. Um, so that's that's exactly why we're seeing uh, such an overtake in the darknet market area, specifically. Excellent. And Ergo, anything to add on to that? Because we're talking about attribution. Um, what about what about uh, UTXO's coin control and? and uh, common inputs. So Deborah co covered, I think, really well, but uh, anything to add on to, to what he said? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd maybe just the three main aspects that we started off with, uh, the issues of attribution, forward privacy, and then sort of, you know, final attribution. Uh, a lot of those are much made much, much more difficult with Monero because of its use of, as, you know, Diverter said, uh, stealth addresses, which sort of, make it much more difficult to do the initial attribution. Uh, the ring CT, which basically fuzzes the transaction graph and makes following the uh, future spending much more difficult. And the use of confidential transactions, which eliminates some of the heuristics used that can be applied to Bitcoin. So, I mean, yeah, it's a, a much sort of more holistic view. Um, and, you know, to get to sort of circle that back to Bitcoin, you know, the initial kind of attribution is, is, you know, much more difficult to avoid on Bitcoin. Um, you know, you can avoid posting a static address, which is a, a good way. Uh, a better way is to use uh, a pay name or a, a Bit47 stealth address, uh, which is sort of like, uh, rather than posting the address that you receive on the blockchain, uh, you post uh, basically like an extended sort of like public key, which is then used to derive the address that you'll receive from. So that sort of makes getting that initial attribution much more difficult, at least on BTC. That, yeah, because this isn't all black and... Yeah, go ahead, Deborah. Uh, no, I was just going to say, um, there, you know, with Monero, there still are things that, you know, you obviously want to avoid. Um, primarily, 
the one being um, doing KYC or using KYC uh, compliant exchanges in order to um, to get to acquire your Monero. Um, these there was uh, something put out a little while back, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was um, it's, it's basically that like they can poison the transaction graph on Monero by if so many of the uh, outputs are, are bought from KYC exchanges. Um, I mean, anytime you're handing over your entire identity to acquire a thing, even though with Monero, once you kind of withdraw away and, and you know make a couple of transactions, that, that transaction graph is, is going to be... I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare um, because of you know the ring CT and the um, the fact that all the uh, output amounts are hidden. Um, as Ergo talked about, that you know the whole change thing, it kind of goes out the window. But there still are you know best practices to to avoid um, any sort of like secondhand or or uh, backhanded attribution. Because you don't want to use KYC exchanges, which they're kind of taking care of that problem for you now on Monero. Um, you may still want to. I know. I know some people that do. Uh, I guess what what they call shuffling uh, of Monero, where they'll make a couple of transactions, um, you know, between wallets before they actually send to markets, for example. Um, so it, there's it's. It's much more ready to use out of the box. Monero is. It's much easier to guard your privacy. It's much. It allows you to make more, you know, what you would call mistakes um, than what Bitcoin does. So, again, that's why it's so attractive to uh, people that just want to open this thing up and use it. They don't want to have to, you know, worry about making potential mistakes and and accidentally having attribution linked to them when. You know, maybe they didn't even use a KYC exchange, but because uh, everybody else in everybody else around them did, it, they they get a, a, you know attributed by process of elimination. Like there's so many ways that your privacy could be compromised. So Monero tries to look at all the ways to prevent that without you even knowing it, basically. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up KYC because if enough people are KYC, they can start to eliminate some things and increase their odds of attributing um, certain transactions. And you you brought up uh, how Monero is being delisted. And so that's actually, some people think that's a good thing that Monero now is harder and harder to get on centralized KYC exchanges. And a lot of us think that it's a good thing for the reasons that you mentioned about the KYC being forever Whereas if you, if you can't get it on centralized exchanges, you have helped everyone else out uh, with that transaction mm -hmm. graph. I do want to take sort of like a devil's advocate because I think we all see the benefits of Monero over Bitcoin. But, and the, the thing is, is, as I've researched and found all these, uh, you know, quote unquote, cyber crimes with the big criminal, you know, North Korea, Russia, all sorts of, of hackers who do steal people's. Uh, crypto they're they're real criminals they're not uh, these aren't just innocent users being surveilled by by governments but they actually are criminals and i've been surprised at how many just use mm -hmm. bitcoin that a lot of the the big you know the bigger players don't don't use monero but they use mm -hmm. bitcoin and so let's talk about that for a second so why do they use bitcoin over monero when monero it offers better out of the box privacy and one reason is that bitcoin simply has uh, greater liquidity and so it's much easier to do things with it and the other reason is some of these are state actors so they kind of don't care if they get attribution because they're sort of nation states so to either of you guys any thoughts on that why still so many of these these gangs and true criminals again versus not criminals use bitcoin over monero despite all the things we've just talked about uh, yeah, I mean, I think you hit it right on the head um, initially with the, the liquidity. Um, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, nation state size attacks or even nation state funded um, hacker farms, for example, which we've seen plenty of that um, in the past, um, you're probably talking about uh, theft of, you know, large amounts of cryptocurrency. And so, you know, the the most liquid market is is Bitcoin. Um, you know where you can you can most easily move into and out of Bitcoin. Um, 
it's it's always for sale it's always ready there's always plenty of people that are willing to both buy and sell this um so that's a that's a major one right there and then again as you said if if you are being funded literally by by a, uh, uh, essentially a criminal nation nation state. Then you know who cares if uh, if you get caught and turned. Like what are they going to do? So you know that's that's definitely two of the big ones. And I know I know Ergo does a lot of um, tracking about like swapping cross chains and stuff. So that's I think that was a big thing that plays into it as well. As Bitcoin is basically bridged to everything. Yeah, I mean, and not just sort of uh, the bridging and, and cross-chain stuff, which is more sort of like thefts, right? Where a lot of the thefts that would happen on Ethereum, hacks of smart contracts or bridges or other sort of, um, I guess, Web3 uh, infrastructure, for lack of a better term. Um, it, often this stuff is attributed to sort of uh, the Lazarus group, uh, the DPRK-sponsored state hacker group even though a lot of the sort of evidence surrounding that is sparse. But um, those entities, and maybe to a, a similar extent, one that I actually spent much more time tracking, uh, the ransomware gangs, uh, they're, besides liquidity, and the fact that they are sort of state-sponsored in some ways, uh, or some cases at least, they're not so much concerned with, you know, gaining super fantastic forward privacy or anonymity for them it's more a game of speed and the typical methods that they'll use uh, are sort of the custodial tumblers which are different from some of the other privacy uh, techniques that we will talk about on on bitcoin but what those what those tools allow them to do is is gain a few steps ahead of any sort of relevant uh investigators uh because what it does is it sort of introduces a lag into how that later transaction spend can be interpreted or when it can be interpreted. And if there's a lag, let's say two days or three days or four days or more between when you know the deposit to a tumbler is made and, and their withdrawal, they're already happily on their way and out the door before uh, an investigator such as myself uh, is any the wiser. Um, so that sort of is the main technique that those guys will use. And for that, Bitcoin is just, just good enough. Right. Yeah, I, I had noticed that it definitely crossing chains back and forth. And at first, when I first started learning about this, I was surprised that it's not great privacy, how they swapped across different chains back and forth. And then that's when I did learn, like what you said, Ergo, was that it's just a matter of speed and trying to outrun the investigation, so to speak. And after they kind of got their funds where they want them to be, they're less concerned um, for the reason that you said. And so I think uh, in terms of Monero, that's something to people need to remember is yes, you know, academically it has better privacy than Bitcoin, but in the real world, we got to kind of think about that and kind of encourage people to use Monero more so that hopefully, and not just, just a day to day spending, just improve that um, liquidity. And I'm glad that you brought up, you know, like North Korea, Lazarus group, these ransomware groups. Um, because I think for a lot of us, for many, many years since the early days, whenever we thought about privacy, it's always kind of innocent people, what we would consider innocent people being surveilled. Um, and so we've been so anti any on-chain heuristics or anything. But, you know, we're not in 2013 anymore, right? We're in 2024 now, where there are large gangs that steal tens, hundreds of millions even, we have lots and lots of real world victims, probably people know people firsthand or themselves actual victims of actual theft. So it's kind of an odd place because we want people to get their money back from these gangs. We want to trace these real criminals yet as privacy advocates, like we don't, we don't want any sort of tools uh, to surveil us, but yet we want strong tools. You know, people lose their life savings. People completely get absolutely wrecked by a lot of these. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, it's, that's, that's kind of a weird paradox we're in where we want perfect privacy, but we don't when someone gets completely, you know, all, all their life savings stolen perhaps and, and worse. So what are your thoughts on that sort of weird dichotomy that we're in now? Um, yeah, I, it's a very 
similar, I guess, stance as uh, we have on, uh, or as at least as I have on several different other things. Um, I inherently believe in the um, the individual, um, and I believe in the individual, the individual's ability um, to do certain things, whether those things be deemed uh, legal or not. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I, you know you should steal off of people. I absolutely detest uh, thievery. I, I can't. I can't stand it. You know, obviously. But um, you know, when you put an um, an agnostic tool out in the world, you put a, a tool out into the world that is not uh, necessarily pro or anti anything. It just is, um, and people are going to use it. Uh, both positively and negatively. Um, we've seen that literally throughout entire human history, uh, whether we're talking about Bitcoin and Monero or pri privacy um, best practices or whether we're talking about you know, firearms, whether we're talking about you know United States dollars and cash. It doesn't matter. All of these things are neither inherently good or bad, and we have to understand that um, people are going to do both of those things with them, good and bad. So, what we or what I want to do is I still want to make sure that these tools are available to the good guys. Um, and I am, I guess I would call myself wise enough to, to believe that I don't necessarily know who is all the good guys and the bad guys. I don't believe my word is any is like the definitive uh, word on who is a criminal, who is a good guy, who is a bad guy. Um, so what I want to do is empower individuals. So I want to make sure that the individuals have access to the same tools that maybe the bad guys will have. We don't want, um, the good guys to be overpowered by the bad guys. So without restricting anyone's abilities to do anything, we just need to empower enough individuals to be able to protect themselves um, and use these tools in the way that would benefit you know themselves and possibly people around them so it's not about it's less about restriction and I would say more about just I believe that there are more good people in the world than there are bad people that's just a belief that I have so based on that I believe if we flood the market with um, these tools, privacy protecting tools, whether that be firearms, whatever, we flood the market with them. I believe that means in the end, you know, that the good guys um, are able to use these tools at a rate that is higher than the bad guys. Um, so rather than try to restrict and which inevitably leads to overreach, I would rather just flood the market and make sure that everybody has access to it, knowing that that means some people are going to get hurt. Um, but in the end, uh, I think the outcome is, is much more desirable than, than trying to start restricting people's abilities. That's where I'm at with it. All right. Well said, Ergo. Where do you fall on that? You, you deal and you see these really large criminal gangs. You see the, like all the destruction that they cause, um, and they cause a lot. So are you with Diverter on the same points? Do you have any slightly different take on that? Um, I guess maybe it's a bit of a cop out, but, uh, how does the old saying go? If you, you know, outlaw privacy, then only, uh, right. you know, outlaws will have it, right. Or we'll, we'll use mm -hmm. the tools, right. Something along those lines. Um, I, I kind of fall in that sort of category, right. It's, uh, the alternative is sort of like a tyrannical, all-empowered state, which, in which case you wind up back at square one where people are being victimized, but in a different way. Um, so, you know, again, I sort of fall similarly to, to, to Diverter where, you know, you should empower the individual um, as much as possible. Uh, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to get messy. But I would say that the alternative is, is just as bad, if not, well, most likely to be worse. Uh, given the track record of most states. So that's where I land. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things I was always told growing up was when you have, you know, can you do the other thing? 
you know, can can you know what's the alternative? Um, and I, I I just don't see the other thing um, being a good for really anybody other than the elites that are already in power. So. Yeah, I think that's that is the trade off that we have to make um, because I think the state can be a larger threat than even the largest criminal mm -hmm. groups. And the reason I bring this up partly is because of this FinCEN thing that's happening. And I want to talk about that. So another plug to Finny Forum, uh, just to jump in as a commercial, March 15th and 16th in Dallas, Texas, where we're going to be talking about this in depth. Also, we're going to have Tor Eakland um, talking about the Bitcoin fraud case and how they used heuristics there to try to say that you know, he, um, Roman, was the guy who, who started and ran Bitcoin Fog. But what came out now is FinCEN and Samurai Wallet, uh, I think, how do how can it be described? Basically wrote a letter to FinCEN and kind of organized it. And then other companies agreed with the letter, signed on. And it was a few different lawyers who kind of uh, wrote up with that. So I don't know if you guys have any insight into that actual kind of letter and where that is. Um if you did, is there anything that you can share about that and what you saw in terms of the, the letter or what FinCEN is proposing? Um, yeah, I, so for those who aren't aware, um, you can find uh, information about the letter and the letter itself um, either on Twitter. Uh, Samurai Wallace posted a thread um, uh, about the letter and some links, or you can visit um, Samurai Wallet blog, which is at uh, blog.samurai, uh, S A M O U R A I, O oh, G's no, uh, blog.samurai.is. Um, and that's a blog site that contains several different um, articles and helpful guides and things like that about uh, Samurai Wallet. And so it's available there. Um, so, long story short, I guess it would be that um, there are fence in um, guidelines I guess under consideration um, and it's a proposal of special measure um, basically calling um, cryptocurrency convertible virtual currency uh, as you know CVCs is what they kind of refer to them as you know they, they make up their own terms and then everybody else is supposed to follow along um, but they're talking about classifying um, mixing as a type of money laundering transaction. Um, so Samurai Wallet uh, looks like kind of headlined um, the, this, uh, a response. Uh, it's not the only response. There, was, there were several uh, different responses that uh, people filed. This one I think is particularly good um, because it's, uh, it's very um, professional, obviously. It's drafted by some very, very good lawyers. Um, who you know work with Samurai Wallet uh, to stay on top of you know the legal game? So it's very professional. Obviously, it addresses all the key points, but it does so in a way that you know you you, you want to see a little attitude um, from from your privacy people. <laughs> and so it still has that little bit of an edge to it, which I appreciate. Um, but it's basically a response. Um, detailing the drastic overreach uh, that's being proposed. Um, it details the way that uh, there are blatant contradictions within the proposal itself. Um, it talks about how they're, uh, they're using powers basically that have never been used before. Um, they're making wide, sweeping, overbroad um applications of terms um it's it's a it's just all the way around a a terrible precedent um a terrible direction for uh fence or anyone else to go down and so it's important in my opinion um to have a good public pushback a good uh you know set of lawyers that you can call on and and draft this type of response it's good to show the blatant hypocrisy in in its uh, in the contradictions and how this obviously is going to um, impact negatively impact much more uh, 
innocent users than probably will even uh, criminals, just same way that KYC does. You know, KYC doesn't really stop criminals. It only it only uh, hinders the, the people that are just trying to use some Bitcoin, buy some Bitcoin. Um, so it's important to highlight all these things and and put it right back on them and, you know, try to make them defend this this horrible um, action that they're trying to take um, while at the same time trying to build something that they can't stop anyway. So I think that's the distinction that, you know, a lot of people uh, fail to make with this that I see because, you know, we've seen several things happen in the past where, um, you know, may, maybe we've talked about people writing a letter to their congressman and it's like, yeah, it's not really going to do any good. You're just writing a letter to the congressman. This is a little bit different in this case because this letter is coming from guys that are already building the thing in such a way that you're not going to be able to stop it anyway. But they're trying to propose to you, hey, look, you, you're you overreaching. Pull it back a little bit. You know, you don't need to go all this way. You're just going to hurt innocent people. And without saying it, um, what's really being done, though, is, you know, look, it's not going to stop anything anyway. That's what's really being put out there. But it's good for the public to be able to read this, to see, to have all these links, to have this very, very well thought out uh, and put together legal response so that the, a greater informed public can see exactly what's going on and then make better decisions going forward and maybe even tag along. And we've seen several companies um, sign on to this letter uh, that... You know, is I think it's very obvious when you look at some of the names that have signed off to this letter that these are not uh, companies that you would necessarily think about Samurai Wallet standing alongside of or standing alongside Samurai Wallet when you look at people like River and Strike, um, Swan, um, Coin Kite. Like these are people that you know, if you've been on Twitter for a while, you've known that there's been you know quite a bit of heavy talk between these groups. But when it comes to this right here, everybody needs to stand up. Uh, link arms and push back together, um, and I'm I'm you know happy to see that that happened here. Yeah, if I could just maybe briefly add a little bit more, sort of like a, a technical level. If you read the original FinCEN documentation, um, it wasn't just sort of mixing as as colloquially we would we would understand it right as either like a coin join or some sort of custodial tumbler is is defined as mixing but they expanded the definition significantly to include effectively anything that isn't you know first name last name crypto address reused over and over again right generating a new address is considered mixing in in the the fincen framework right this is just from sort of a a, a native crypto perspective it's just absolutely ridiculous uh and outlandish. Um, so yeah, I mean, it needs to be pushed back on in every way possible. And as Diverter said, right, you don't just do that by um, uh, writing some uh, pretty strongly worded letters. You also work on building tools that make it much more difficult for them to sort of stop this in general, because ultimately the, you know, the state is going to state. Yeah, I would like to invite anyone who wants to give a comment or a question on this. We're at 45 minutes, and I think we're going to stop around uh, kind of the one hour mark, so about 50 minutes or so. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and request to speak, and we'll get you up on stage here. And also make sure to check out finuform.com, where we're going to go into this in depth over a period of two days. So this is, you know, very interesting what's going on here. And Diverter kind of brought it up about, you know, a strongly worded letter to your congressman. And it's interesting to see the evolution of a lot of this where, you know, not too long ago, we would kind of laugh at, oh, you, you wrote a letter to FinCEN, ha ha, like, let's just make good tools, right? But now Samurai Wallet, who is you know, known for very strong privacy stances, strong privacy tools, is organizing sort of this, this legal pushback and a very good, strong pushback. So I think it's very interesting to see that happening. And maybe it talks about, it, it tells just how bad the FinCEN, uh, what they're proposing is that would elicit this sort of a response from people who normally... Uh, you know, as you guys said, don't like each other or don't work well together, that that's just how bad um, things have gotten, that that's what it takes. 
Yeah, I mean, when you get to a place where, as Ergo mentioned, I mean, generating a new address is, is mixing, I, I, you have you have jumped the shark. Um, so I think that this sort of response, um, and again, there's there's been quite a few of them submitted. Um, this one, to me, kind of stands out a little bit. The Coin Center one was also good, but this one stands out um, not only in the substance, but in the uh, the signatures as i mentioned like it it really says a lot um to see these names next to each other uh, pushing back in this way so yes i think that's that is a testament to just how drastic an overreach this is just how really truly uh, bad this guidance or suggestion is um the problem in, it with a lot of other I guess companies in this space is that rather than try to organize um, some sort of you know pushback and, uh, and not just on their own but an organized um, you know a, an entire group of people across different aspects of the Bitcoin space to stand up together and say this is wrong um, how many times have we seen the entire opposite uh, of that where we see that this is again not even it's not law um it, it, there's nothing in the actual regulation yet there is no actual law but how many times have we seen companies preemptively go ahead and start implementing um some of these suggestions that have still never become law um and do things like start working with chain analysis um to try to you know track their users their funding chain analysis with fees to use their service like we've seen a lot of preemptive compliance so i think it's very you know needed um to see that there are plenty of people that are not willing to preemptively comply that are willing to sign up with people that they normally wouldn't be standing alongside and and push back so i think it's very very important but um again to me um a letter like this without also being uh, building the tools that makes a letter like this essentially a courtesy um it, it says less so the fact that the tools are being built to try their very best to obsolete all of this um it, it really adds to the letter for me Yeah, I agree. And in, in some ways, it shows a bit of desperation that they have to go so far. Basically, they're doing anything they can. They're, they don't seem to have any break. It's all gas on this pedal. And I think that shows just how much of a threat they, they think it is. Otherwise, why right. bother yeah. sort of thing? So it, in, in a way, it, it just shows you know their, their desperation. And what's so powerful about FinCEN is this isn't just a u.s government entity and other people might say who cares it's the u.s government the rest of the world is not the mm -hmm. united states it's just another u.s problem but the fincen that's not the case fincen sets kind of the standards for for most or a large portion of the western mm -hmm. world at least yeah and and you know the what you've just said just a second ago is exactly what has been said for years by i know myself and plenty of others that you know this this technology is i mean it is an inherently subversive technology like it, it it drains power away from those who currently have it and attempts to give it back to the individual and so you know once it starts actually doing that um that's when you know you're going to see this the type of overreach that we're seeing now you know i mean i know it's much overused but that you know we're, we're kind of getting into the the then we fight you phase you know then they fight you so we're, we're they ignored this thing laughed at it for so long you know it's just nerd money nobody uses it nobody cares and it kept growing and growing and growing and so now it's gotten to a point where maybe they can't just outright head-on attack it but they're definitely not just going to let it live and just continue. They're not just going to shrug and say, oh, well, I guess we got it wrong. Maybe these guys, you know, know what they're doing. They're not just going to hand over power in that way. It doesn't, power transfers don't work like that. Um, so this is the inevitable conclusion, which is, again, why I think it's so important that 
you know, the letter is a secondary act to the building of the tools. You, you, you build the tools that try to obsolete all of these suggestions. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you want to see this stuff outlawed either. Um, you know, we, we want to continue to be able to see a legal bootstrapping of the network. Um, we want to continue to see users be added that are privacy conscious. We don't want everyone to suddenly become a criminal today, which is essentially what happens with this. Um, you know, if you I mean, just by using a, an HD wallet, basically you're, you're a criminal, you're mixing every transaction. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's so important that we stand together um, for the things that need to be stand together on. But we also, you know, I hope that this is maybe a sort of wake up call to a lot of these companies that I see signed off here that I know have absolutely not been focused on privacy of their users um, in particular. That maybe it serves as a bit of a wake up call for them too. Yeah, I agree. I think it is a wake up call for them because in the past, they, none of these companies seem to have cared whatsoever. In fact, you mentioned pre complying, mm -hmm. which is exactly what a lot of them done. And I think now they're saying, seeing this is sort of the final boss is FinCEN and they're sort of seeing this as an existential threat because it is FinCEN. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So if you guys want to ask a question or give a comment, just request to speak and I'll get you up here. Um, Ergo, you had talked before about, uh, you know, like ransomware gang, uh, gangs, uh, North Korea. Um, I can't imagine that this FinCEN proposal of not being able to create a fresh address, not being able to have a non-custodial wallet. I can't imagine that's going to affect North Korea and the ransomware gangs. No, I mean, it's it's obviously not about that. Um, just as is typically the case, it's never about sort of whatever the, the boogeyman du jour is. Uh, it's usually about seizing power and, and never giving it back, right? Um, I mean, one of the questions that I would ask, and I don't know the answer here, is, is who really sort of wrote this, this proposal? Who really got their hooks into all of this? Um, is it just, you know, bureaucrats being bureaucrats, uh, where do the bureaucrats get their guidance from is, is probably another, uh, important question to ask. Uh, and from there, you probably don't have to look too much further than sort of the, the chain surveillance, uh, industrial complex, uh, who very frequently speaks out against, uh, strong privacy, uh, anonymity, um, various other privacy enhancing tools, uh, so, I mean, to me, it's sort of like a logical conclusion that, you know, these guys are working together. Uh, how do we make our business, how do we make everybody's life easier in terms of tracking and, and you know, improving our business model? Um, well, you do something like this where, you know, it's now criminalized to generate a new address, which is just, you know, again, pretty, pretty laughable. Yeah. And in these court cases where um, these different people are accused of uh, maybe creating a mixer or running a dark net market or whatever it might be, um, you do see uh, a large overlap between private industry and law enforcement. And I think reasonable people would say, hey, when you're really going after a true criminal gang who steals, you know, people's life savings from grandma or even ourselves, who we think we're sophisticated, who have ransomware for hospitals and for, for schools and for libraries, that's probably a lot of us would say, hey, that's good that private industry, which moves faster than the government and government with their power, that's good. They work together. But that actually is becoming a problem where that crosses a line to where they're going after the bad guys to where now, hey, wait a minute, they're going after everyone who's just a person, a user of Bitcoin. To me, that's where it says we got to like, wait a minute, that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's just very classic, right? Um, you use these these big high profile events as, as a, uh, an excuse to, to you know, seize the, uh, the rights or seize the uh, ability of normal people to go about their lives and, and just not be bothered, right? And again, uh, you kind of raise a, a, a valid point, right? It's, it's uh, none of this has anything to do with North Korea. None of this has anything to do with Russian ransomware gangs. Uh, those are all extra you know, jurisdictional to the United States. Um, and there's very little, if anything, sort of the powers that be can do about that uh, as long as those entities are operating in, in jurisdictions that 
uh, are sort of non-compliant with sort of like the broader U.S. security state regime. Um, so, you know, uh, I mean, again, it just continues to raise the question of, of why does something like this need to be uh, enacted? Um, you know, uh, it's just, uh, to me, just another blatant sort of power grab. Yeah, and I would, you know, love to see these chain analytics company, which they do do a lot of good. They do actually go after some really bad guys, but I would love to see them come out with some statements or something saying, hey, we're willing to do this, but we're not willing to do that. We're willing to work on these types of cases, but not these other kind of cases. Um, I would love to see them having some sort of code of ethics in terms of where does innocent surveillance of people begin versus true criminals. And I don't think any of those companies have. I could be totally wrong. But otherwise, it just kind of seems like the private industry and government sort of take it too far with the, the revolving door and just not having any breaks at all on what they're willing to do. And it, there does seem to be this really strong financial incentive. If the FinCEN uh, guidelines are implemented, that's more business for these analytics companies. Now they can charge money to just see if someone created a fresh address rather than going after the big gangs. So it's like this perverse financial um, motivation there. Yeah, I mean, it really is sort of the um, fascist, you know, merger of corporation and state. Um, there really aren't any bounds to what, you know, these guys will uh, will sort of do. I mean, I, I try to keep tabs on them as best we can. Uh, they will put some stuff out publicly, you know, from time to time, they'll do things like go to Davos and speak to the World Economic Forum, which for most people is a good enough heuristic to just say, oh, I know exactly where these people come from. Um, in other cases, they'll sort of do the podcast circuit. I believe, I don't know, maybe four years ago now, there was a what Bitcoin did podcast with one of the, you know, higher ups chain analysis and Peter McCormick was trying to push them and say, you know, who won't you sell your product to? And the answer was some sort of like, um, you know, pseudo mumbo jumbo democracy index, you know, we pick the people that we won't work with, or we will work with. Um, but, you know, again, you can sort of go and do a little bit of research, listen to what these people have to say about privacy, particularly strong privacy, and, and that will sort of tell you everything you need to know. Um, you know, to go sort of one step further, you can see sort of how they prosecute things and, and who they, they choose to be sort of associated with. And in a lot of cases, right, that, you know, because of the, the source of their sort of funding is basically derived from sort of state enforced, uh, you know, monopolies on, on censorship and, and anti-privacy sort of uh, uh, stances, they, they will basically do whatever the state says, right, in terms of who they'll prosecute. There basically is no limit. If, if the Department of Justice wants it done, they're in, right? And there is no sort of, uh, there is no sort of fire break there. I mean, you can look no further than sort of what they've done to Roman Sterling off. Um, I know you were supposed to <clears throat> interview Tor uh, in the last week or so, but um, Tor hasn't been able to speak for some time on this case because the uh, the DC court and the powers that be have ruled that uh, him speaking on the Roman Sterling off case will just tantamount him out to sort of jury tainting, which is just absolutely laughable that anyone in the District of Columbia will be tainted by uh, you know, this lawyer doing any podcast. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's really a very perverse, uh, very big issue. Um, uh, we've, we've been involved in that case a little bit, um, you know, trying to help as best we can. Uh, but at least Tor uh, and Michael seem to have um, sort of the balls to stand up, which is, which is good to see. Yeah, I'm really glad that Tor is going to be uh, the uh, keynote speaker at Finney Forum 2024. He says that the case should be over by the time of the conference. I believe the case is in the first week of March for them. Um, there's a small possibility it will go on past the date and Tor can't make it, but it's pretty confident that it will end before the conference. And so at Finney Forum, he'll be able to um, discuss uh, which way the case went one way or the other. I think we might have lost Diverter. Diverter, are you still there? Uh, we might have lost him. Um, all right, we're just about out of time. I just want to make sure that if anyone has a last minute question or comment to go ahead and right now is your final chance uh, to request to speak and we'll get you on. Um, but I do want to give the final word to Ergo and if Diverter can get back on, I think we lost him though. 
but um, I'm glad we can do this space. And I wasn't sure how much we can talk about Bitcoin Fog and Ergo, what you guys have done, maybe at the conference uh, when you have some time to think about it. And by then the case has been over. Maybe we can hear a little bit about your work, but I do appreciate that. So everyone check out finuform.com because uh, obviously we're covering these topics. Um, so I think Ergo, you're the only one that's left. We we lost Diverter, but let's think worst case scenario. This will be like my final question comment. Let's let's think worst case scenario that the FinCEN uh, proposal goes through and truly uh, creating a new address is a criminal offense. And using Samurai Wallet is a criminal offense. And having a, your own wallet is a criminal offense. Um, what do what do people do in that case? Um, well, one of the big things that we would do is is probably make a First Amendment case, uh, sort of like an extension to the uh, FinCEN uh, pushback that we saw today from the Samurai team. Right. So that would be uh, basically an instant lawsuit filed. Uh, not just by likely the Samurai Wallet team, but uh, others in as well. Um, so that would be sort of like the immediate beachhead. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, for the most part, you should have the you know choice to run the software that you want to run on the devices that you own. Uh, and making the choice to either comply or not will be sort of up to the individual. Uh, as this really is open source software, people will still be able to hopefully access and install it and download it and use it as they need to, especially in jurisdictions that are sort of uh, less uh, compliant with FinCEN. Okay, and then Diverta, you're back on. I think my question uh, to Ergo is what happens, what's the worst case scenario if the FinCEN guidelines actually do get implemented? And Ergo was talking about a First Amendment case and one or two other things. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And then Sam, uh, you're now a speaker, so once Diverter's uh, Dan, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your, your question or, or give your comment. Um, yeah, so I, I would uh, agree, obviously, that uh, you, there would be an immediate uh, challenge on, you know, First Amendment grounds, which we saw a lot of these similar um, similar type uh, actions and fights back, you know, with the, uh, the crypto wars in the 90s um, and, you know, challenges of, of, to free speech as it relates to code. So, you know, a, a lot of those things would um, perhaps be sort of relitigated in a, in a, a little bit of a different light. Um, so ideally, um, in a worst case scenario type situation, um, we would have, again, enough people uh, that have the ability um, and the will uh, to want to continue building and running these tools, even in the face of, um, you know, persecution or prosecution. Uh, so it's important that tools are built in such a way that um, if users uh, want to run them, want and desire to run them, that they can do so and connect to other users, um, whether the state allows it or not. "Quote unquote," uh, whether they uh, whether it is legal or um, deemed illegal, it, that is secondary to whether or not it can actually be run. Um, you know, just like with the issue with Tornado Cash, um, still running. When you look at things being decentralized, the whole point is to not be able to have the head get cut off. Um, now, passing this sort of uh, regulation or that is a sort of way to try to cut the head off of the the beast, you know, by just saying, okay, well, you're all criminals. Essentially, what's happening to Monero on exchanges right now, you know, like with Bitcoin, they can they can like flag certain transactions and say, oh, this transaction, you can't do it that way. You can't do it this way. They can't do it individually with Monero. So what do they do? Well, you, you can't have Monero at all. Um, and it's a similar type of thing here is that, you know, we're building the tools that prevent them from being able um, to violate every person's privacy on a whim. And so they're trying to cut the head off the snake. But it's important that we push back in every way, meaning legally, meaning running the tools despite um, their legality. Um, but to do that, we have to have 
both the will and the ability. So you have to be able to protect yourself while you're running this tool. Um, and you have to, you know, have, again, the will to stand up in the face of uh, prosecution by the state. And I'm going here to tell you, that's not an easy thing. A lot of people say, you know, the whole come and take it thing. Um, you know, you see that all the time on Twitter, but it's going to be a far, far um, lower number that are actually going to be willing to, you know, fight the good fight um, if it turns bad. And so the goal should be get as many as we can that are willing to use them while the, we're still legal now. Um, that way, if the worst case scenario happens, we hopefully still have a decent little amount that are willing to keep this thing going um, in the face of that type of adversity. So I hope it doesn't happen. But in the end, I think it kind of is an inevitability if we continue to build these things to do, you know, to work the way that they work. So we'll see. Well said, Sam. Let's. Uh, what's your question or comment you want to add to this, and then we can wrap things up. Hi guys, thanks so much for putting this space together. Um, I was just wondering, really, if any of you guys see parallels between this and really how the surveillance state was expanded um, after nine eleven. Uh, because I see quite a lot of parallels, um, and something else that strikes me is that, uh, you know, um, after 9-11, a program was put in place by the NSA known as Trailblazer, and later PRISM and X-Keyscore, and these programs uh, were done on the justification of catching terrorists, stopping bad guys more broadly, but, um, you know, whistleblowers within the organization like Bill Binney and Thomas Drake had already been working on a much more targeted program like Thin Thread, which was uh, discarded in favor of Trailblazer, which is more of a bulk surveillance system. So I guess my question would be if you guys see parallels in that strategy of instead of going for a targeted and more logical approach of actually doing your job and uh, pursuing criminals and more broadly speaking, bad guys, uh, there seems to be a broader policy of pursuing bulk collection and uh i'm wondering if you guys see that parallel and if you do i'm wondering how you would see bitcoiners seeking to combat that in the future uh, good question so we'll finish on that question uh ergo do you have any um answers to sam's question about parallels between kind of the nsa patriot act and those efforts yeah, I mean, I think it's a sort of a great parallel, right? Um, you know, a problem, reaction, solution kind of thing, right? Um, nation state actor can't be stopped uh, in a foreign land such as North Korea. Um, they're using crypto, they're mixing their coins, and therefore you can't, you know, generate a fresh address. Um, I mean, it's the same sort of logic, right? It just treats everyone as a criminal, uh, normal people as a criminal, rather than sort of... Uh, the, the more targeted work um, that sort of really should be done. Um, again, just another classic uh, power grab excuse. Uh, very good parallel, Sam. Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree. Uh, they, you know, they, they um, use one headline incident uh, to then push these things, which is why, you know, if you look back through history, we've had so many um, incidents of what you call false flags, you know, these, these, they create the reason to then release uh, th their privacy attack or whatever sort of attack they want to release. Um, that's happened several times. Uh, so, yeah, I, there's there's definitely uh, a lot of parallels. And the, the dragnet surveillance is kind of the thing that um, I try to help people get out of um, before it becomes more targeted. So the way I kind of see things is if you are a targeted entity of the government, if you as an individual become a targeted ent entity of, say, for example, the NSA, uh, you know, there's very little you're going to be able to do um, to be able to effectively continue to guard your privacy. It's not that it can't be done, but, man, you'd have to, you'd have, to have some real chops. Now, what most people are being... Um, scooped up in right now is this uh, this dragnet surveillance and they don't even know it so that's the type of thing that 
I, I, we generally want to try to prevent against uh, people from uh, just having all, all their information collected on them uh, essentially passively um, because they have that information for as long as they want to keep it. And then at any point when they decide that you are now a targeted entity, they have an enormous trove of information that they can go to. And at some point along that line, you probably made a mistake. So, you know, I, I think they prefer that dragnet uh, type instead of the targeted type because obviously it it is much more difficult to just do your job correctly i mean that's that's pretty basic but you know if you were passive if you're able to passively collect information on literally billions of people and then retroactively sift through it to find the stuff that you want you know you, that's that's a key a key to the kingdom right there you can pretty well do whatever you want with it so there are a ton of similarities between this, between PGP crypto wars, between firearms, between like it's all interrelated and it's all essentially the same playbook. So I think that it's important for us to learn from history, um, to learn to see what they have done before um, in order to be able to anticipate what we have to look forward to and then what we need to do to push back on it. What has worked, what hasn't worked. And then move forward from there. So yes, I think it's a, a lot of similarities. All right, I think we'll end on that. Well said, Divertus. I want to thank Ergo and Diverter for taking the time to do this Twitter space. I want to thank them as well for being speakers at Finny Forum 2024. And say thanks, Sam, for that final question. Uh, we're going to keep doing more Twitter spaces for Finny Form leading up to the conference, so make sure to tune in. Next week, we'll be talking about Monero and some Monero experts about what's the latest in Monero and the advancements there. Um, but otherwise, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week at our next Twitter space. Yeah, thank you. Come on down see us.